Welcome to CBS Sports HQ. I'm Amanda Guerra along with Ryan Wilson. Pete Briscoe, Brady Quinn here on set. Look, the draft is done. We are far from finished. In fact, Pete is doing the most work out of all of us. He is handing out draft grades, and you can see it on CBSSports.com right now. We are going to go through each team and the grade that Pete gave them. Uh, we're going to start with the highest grades, okay. and then we're going to move down. So let's start with the Ravens, Pete. The lone A+. Plus out of all of the teams, tell us why you gave the Ravens an A+. Plus. Eric DaCosta knocked it out of the park. I mean, he, he absolutely uh, owned this draft from top to bottom. And people will say he should have drafted a wide receiver. Maybe he should have in the sixth round. I mean, in the fourth round. But the reality is he picks the best possible football player, and they did a great job with it. They started in the first round. I didn't love Kyle Hamilton as much as most people, but I love their second round, uh, their other second first round pick, Tyler Linderbaum, the center. He will be in front of Lamar Jackson for a long, long time. David Ajaba, when he's healthy, wow. But Linderbaum was the best pick, but top to bottom, this was the best draft of the entire weekend. A plus. Yeah, it was good. You're, you're exactly right, Pete. And, and it sounds like the Ravens had a lot of fun. Not quite as much fun as you had in Vegas by the sound of your voice there. I'm not sure you got up to, but I'm glad you're back home <laughs> safe and sound. Uh, <laughs> listen, we, we worked the draft till 10 p.m. and then Pete disappeared till 8 the next morning. You do the math. But in terms of what the Ravens did, I, I thought I think he's yeah. right. The questions are about the wide receiver, but uh, other than that, they got some tight ends. They got Charlie Kohler, who's a really good player out of state. They got Isaiah Likely out of Coastal Carolina, who's a really good run blocker and can also add in the pass game. And they even got a punter, Jordan Stout, the best punter in this draft class, not named Matt Ariza. He ended up going before Matt Ariza, but uh, to Pete's point, uh, the, the Ravens do this each and every year. This team is a lot better, even if Lamar Jackson didn't seem super excited, at least in the first round, about how things unfolded. Three's company here, because I love their draft. I mean, you look at top to bottom, every single one of these players will be an impact player in, in some fashion or form. They're either going to be a starter, or they're going to provide depth and some value there. And I think there might be some concerns from Ravens fans, because you trade away Hollywood Brown, you're like, okay, remember we're going to draft a guy who's going to be a wide receiver for us. Not necessarily the case, but they're going to get two tight ends that I love and Charlie Kohler who can use in that fashion, split them out wide, play more of your traditional wide tight end and Isaiah Likely as well. Uh, running backs too. I mean, uh, Tyler Beatty from Missouri doesn't get enough credit. He's small in size, but this dude can hit some home runs. Led the SEC last year in the 10 plus runs uh, throughout the course of the season. So they've got some gems up and down their draft class. Absolutely loved it. That's one of the reasons why the Baltimore Ravens are always in the hunt. Ravens, again, the only A+. plus. Let's go to the Chiefs, so not far behind them. Pete giving the Chiefs an A. They had picks 29 and 30, but they did move up, made a trade with the Patriots uh, to move up to 21 to get Trent McDuffie. Ryan, we'll start with you here. Do you agree with the A for the Chiefs? Yeah, it actually might be too low. That's how good this Chiefs draft was. I thought they absolutely crushed it. Trent McDuffie is a fantastic football player. Played outside primarily Washington, but he can play in the slot there. Uh, they also got... George Karloftis, he's only been playing football for eight years since he came over from Greece. Uh, and he had a fantastic 2019 season. Uh, COVID year happened last year. He wasn't quite as effective, but he does a lot of things really well. Sky Moore is a great football player, but I'm going to start uh, end this with Brian Cook, the safety out of Cincinnati. Transfer from Howard, where he played cornerback for two years. He can play deep. He can play near the line of scrimmage. He can play in the slot. He comes downhill and absolutely crushes guys. You see him playing in coverage here, and he is a as sure a player as you can have on the back end. This is one of my favorite plays right here. He just runs through this poor running back who had no idea it was coming. Uh, Justin Reed, they signed. They lost Honey Badger. Juan Thornhill is going to be on his uh, final year of his rookie deal. Brian Cook is incredibly smart, and I think he comes in right away and is a contributor in Kansas City. I mean, they had a good draft as well, top to bottom. I, look, I like the, the other corner, Kyler Gordon at Washington, more than McDuffie, but it fills a need right away for them. I mean, these guys going to be a starter. They had a big hole there. And I love Karloftis. I think he's the best pick on this board. That guy plays hard, tough, physical all the time. And, you know, there was some thought that he could possibly drop out of the first round, and the Chiefs were wise to grab him uh, because they need to amp up that pass rush. Nice job by the Chiefs this weekend. I'm right there with you guys. Uh, I thought they had a tremendous draft and really, again, top to bottom, looking at some of the deeper picks. Isaiah Pacheco out of the Rutgers is one of those backs that ran extremely fast at the combine, maybe even more so than what we just you know, showed on tape, but he's versatile, he catches the football well in the backfield. He was really one of their biggest playmakers at Rutgers. And then Darren Kennard, that's the type of offensive lineman out of Kentucky that you're looking for with that nasty streak, that meanness to him. 
they could use some of that in Kansas City. You get the feeling sometimes because they're so pass happy because they have a guy like Patrick Mahomes at quarterback and they want to give him every opportunity to throw the football that you don't bring that same physicality to the offensive line. He brings that. I wouldn't be shocked if he doesn't end up finding his way in to be a starter and bringing some of that nastiness to this group. So that's just a couple of guys. But once again, a front office that did an unbelievable job building around uh, Patrick Mahomes and really creating a roster that's going to be there to compete for Super Bowls every year. The Chiefs getting an A from Pete, as do the Jets. Look in their first round. They got a whole bunch of people. Sauce Gardner, Garrett Wilson uh, traded up to get Jermaine Johnson and right off the bat got Brees Hall there in the second round. I talked to Emory Hunt. He said, I think this is a more talented roster than the Patriots. I don't know what you think about that, but what do you think about the A for the Jets? Uh, no, I think it's fair, especially with what they did in the first round. I mean, you checked off so many boxes that you needed. You needed a cornerback. You needed a big playmaker, wide receiver, especially considering that now kind of throws out the window getting Debo Samuel to come in, right? You get Jermaine Johnson, too, <clears throat> because you need help off of the edge. And you get Brees Hall coming in there uh, as a running back to help take some of the pressure off Zach Wilson. Jeremy Ruckert uh, is going to have a better NFL career than he had a college career because of that offense at Ohio State. I mean, top down again at every single level. You either have impact starters immediately or guys who are going to add depth and add to this group. But Garrett Wilson's the one that stood out to me because I think that year two with Zach Wilson, the way year one looked, you needed to get him a playmaker. You needed to find him someone that he can rely on within this group to make some plays down the field and see what you have in Zach Wilson. I mean, nowadays, too, after that third year, and I know we're a couple years away from that, you have to make that big decision on the fifth year option. I think after year two, they're gonna have a pretty good idea of what Zach Wilson is because of the weapons they've given him. I'm with you, Brady. I, I thought they did an outstanding job, job of trying to build this around that quarterback. Uh, one knock, uh, you know, maybe at some point take an offensive lineman a little earlier. They have questions at the right tackle position, but uh, I like what they did. And, and the best thing they did was I know there was some talk about trading that number 10 pick to San Francisco with some additional picks to get Debo Samuel. This will work out well for them because Garrett Wilson will play and play well and he'll be a lot cheaper. So I thought they had an outstanding draft as well. During the draft, how uh, me and BMAC were, were more on the trade for Debo Samuel wagon and you you thought they should go with Garrett Wilson. I think you're right. Garrett Wilson is going to be a really good football player. And, and as Brady noted, now it's Zach Wilson's turn to prove that he is worth being that that top uh, that number two overall pick that he was last season. Uh, last season was rough for him for a lot of reasons. You have to hope Mekhi Becton comes back and, and can fill that left tackle void. They do have uh, Max Mitchell there. He's not going to be able to, to pencil in a left tackle anyway, but he'll provide some depth. But again, it comes down to, to Zach Wilson turning the corner and, and bringing it all together in year two. All right, let's go to the Eagles next. Pete giving them our first B. It is a B plus. Uh, look, Pete, the biggest thing that happened during the draft was they got A.J. Brown. Uh, you gave them your best pick as Jordan Davis, your worst as N'Kobe Dean. So why the B plus for the Eagles? Well, I really like Jordan Davis. I, I think Jordan Davis is going to be one of those players that is actually better in the NFL in terms of his ability to rush the passer. Uh, you saw glimpses of it at Georgia. There were so many guys getting up the field. They blitzed so much that uh, I think when he gets to the NFL, you'll see a better pass rusher from the interior. They needed help there. Fletcher Cox getting up in the years. Uh, and then they made the trade to get, you know, Brown. I mean, that's big for them. That gives them another big body receiver, a guy who can go up and catch the ball, and somebody who can, they can help build this team around Jalen Hurst to find out if he's the long-term answer. So, uh, N'Kobe Dean, the reason I ping him, and I think at the third it's okay, uh, but that body, I mean, he's a little guy and his body's already starting to break down. That's always a concern uh, when you take a lot of smallish linebacker when his body's starting to break down even before he gets into the National Football League. All right, let's go to the Cowboys. Pete Prisco giving them a B plus. Uh, it was interesting to watch Cowboys fans on Twitter. Uh, they did not love Tyler Smith in the first round. Pete said, look, he doesn't mind that, though. What do you think of, uh, about the B plus for the Cowboys? <laughs> well, I'll start off by saying this. For the team that was most penalized last year, to then draft a player that, yes, it's a need. Tyler Smith, I think, is an athletic tackle. He's got a physical presence. Not a finished product by any means, but he was flagged, I think, once per game. So you're only bringing on more problems there in, in Tyler Smith. I think it was a good draft. My favorite pick, honestly, was Sam Williams, who's going to be an edge rusher out of Ole Miss. I think he may provide some of uh, what they're going to lose out on Randy Gregory moving on to the Denver Broncos. A lot of upside. He's got burst off the edge. I think he's just hitting the tip of what he can be uh, as an edge rusher in this Dallas Cowboys defense. And you know Dan Quinn will coach him up. A couple other nice picks, too, in my opinion. Jalen Tolbert, one of the more underrated wide receivers, too. Maybe that helps a little bit with that Amari Cooper loss, trading him to the Cleveland Browns. And then Jake Ferguson, 
very reliable tight end. You know where he's going to be. He's one of those sticks movers, uh, and, and he's a guy that's going to fit into that mix as well as far as being able to block at the point of attack and catch the football down the field. So there's not a, a lot of needs on the Dallas Cowboys roster. I think that's what makes it difficult, especially when you draft an offensive lineman from uh, you know, a non-Power 5 team, and he may be a little obscure to people, even though if you watch the tape, he's got a lot of upside. I mean, he could be a guy who's going to be helped paving the way for Dak Prescott in that backfield for a long time. A team with a few more needs, the Lions, but they also get a B-plus from Pete Prisco in the draft. They landed Aiden Hutchinson second overall. They traded up, Ryan, to get Jamison Williams. Do you agree with the B-plus for the Lions? I, I sure do, man, and I agree with the, the, uh, the decision by the organization to trade for Jamison Williams. We've talked for weeks, probably months now, about how Jamison Williams would be wide receiver one had he not torn his ACL. He's ahead of recovery, it looks like, and he'll probably be ready to go perhaps in November or sometime around then. But you're planning on having him long term, even if it's only for half of this season or maybe something less than that. Uh, I love that pick, the Aiden Hutchinson pick. Feels like a layup to me, but the, the pick that I loved the most was Josh Paschal out of Kentucky, the edge rusher there, who's 6'2 and a half, 268, ran a 477, insanely athletic with a 37 inch vertical. And he doesn't look like your prototypical pass rusher necessarily, but you see him shooting gaps there. He did that consistently on tape. He's quick off the snap, he uses his hands well, he's incredibly disruptive in the backfield. I mean, that's something that if you're Dan Campbell, you have to be uh, frothing in the mouth to get into Detroit. That's exactly what they did. And I think he's going to be a better pro than he was in Kentucky because he was just sort of figuring things out. You see the high motor on the backside. He did that consistently as well when you saw him. I love that fit in Detroit. I love that fit with Dan Campbell. We talked over and over here on HQ how the Packers had not drafted a wide receiver in the first round since 2002. At some point, our mocks had them taking two in the first round. Didn't happen until the second round. So we're still on track with the Packers here. Pete, you're giving them a B plus. Why? Well, I think they were true to their board. I mean, you know, people want to say, oh, you got to go get a wide receiver. But if your board shows that you like Quay Walker, who I really like, uh, the linebacker out of Georgia, and Devontae Wyatt more, uh, then you go get him. And then you wait to get your wide receiver, which they did. They traded back up in the second round and got uh, Christian Watson. Uh, I think they drafted a couple other wide receivers. Zach Tom is an interesting player out of Wake Forest who I really like. Uh, I think they had a really good draft, and they waited and were patient and didn't rush the wide receiver. So, uh, again, the Packers seem to get it. I know people criticize them for not taking wide receivers. They did take three of them in this draft. With Rodgers, I guarantee you two of them will be players at some point this season. When we didn't touch on Christian Watson, they did take a wide receiver. Yeah, they did. He is a guy that I think when you I look at... I said that. We, we heard you say that, but a little more in depth. You know, the guy they take in Christian Watson, you know, like they found Devonta Adams in the second round. Watson's got a lot of the skill set that you're looking for as far as top end speed. We saw that in the 40. Big playmaking ability. He's got kind of that typical size you're looking for in a number one wide receiver trying to get open in separation versus man-to-man -man coverage. The only concern I have is, and it's not even the fact that he played at North Dakota State, it, it's that he drops some easy passes. On, on tape, you see sometimes that maybe he's not the most natural pass catcher. He's got the ability to make all the catches. It just sometimes the simple ones, you know, he ends up having a hard time with. But that's not going to fly with Aaron Rodgers. But all in all, uh, the Packers should get a lot of credit for sticking to their board, drafting quality players and guys who are honestly going to help out their defense. Where, you know, we've talked about it for years now. The Achilles heel of this defense has been their inability to stop the run. You get Devontae Wyatt, who I believe was the second best D tackle in this draft class, and Quay Walker. They're going to help solve that issue, as we saw Georgia be able to do with that national championship team, now a record most players taken in an NFL draft. Got a whole bunch of teams getting a B-plus from Pete Persco, including the Texans. Uh, Ryan, I want to send this one to you. What do you think about the grade, and what was your favorite pick from this team? Yeah, so it wasn't too long ago that we were panning Bill O'Brien for making terrible personal decision, personnel decisions. Uh, Nick Casario came in. We didn't know what he was thinking. Jack Easterby seemed to have control. And now that all has gone by the wayside. I think Pete's right with the grade. I thought they did a fantastic job of a draft weekend. No one really thought Derek Singley would be an option until a few days before the draft, and that buzz sort of took off and it actually happened. But, but the pick that I liked the best is one of Pete's favorite players in this whole class, Jalen Petrie, the safety out of BYU. Plays in the slot, can play in the box, can play along the defensive line if you want him to. He's incredibly versatile, incredibly smart, academic All-American at points during his time at Baylor. Fantastic athlete who helps you immediately on a defense that's not very, really very good, but they did a great job uh, of stocking that defense through the draft, starting with Stingley. I think Petrie's right up there. He could have been a first-round talent. I love the idea of him going to Houston in that Lovey Smith defense. Only two more teams getting a B-plus from Pete Prisco for the draft, and one of them, 
the Giants taking Kevon Thibodeau and Evan Neal in the first round. Brady, your favorite pick of theirs came in the second round, though. Yeah, look, I mean, everyone's going to talk about their first <laughs> round, right? You get Kevon Thibodeau, you need an edge rusher, you get arguably one of the best. And then Evan Neal, a guy who can be a perennial pro bowler, a tackle for him, also another need. So we'll, we'll save that for everyone else to talk about. Uh, Wandale Robinson, all right? This offense needs some flexibility, some versatility. This is the guy to go to. He looked phenomenal last year at Kentucky. He looked better than that back when he was playing for Nebraska. But it doesn't matter if it's down the field, screen game, jet sweeps, return game. This guy can do it all. And if you're moving on from Kadarius Toney, well, you basically found the type of guy that's going to fit in this offense uh, for Brian Dable and make it go and maximize the most you can for Daniel Jones. So I love the Wandale Robinson pick. This one stood out to me, but really even throughout. I mean, you look at further down the draft, Dane Belton uh, out of Iowa, versatile uh, defensive back who's going to help them immediately on special teams. Then later on, Micah McFadden's a tackling machine. Same thing, special teams potentially finds a role in the field uh, at, on defense. And, and same thing with Darian Beavers, kind of fits that same mold. So a lot of just good, good football players. Uh, I was a big fan of the draft. Are we bumping it up to an A or are you going with the B plus? No, no, B plus is, is pretty solid. Okay, yeah. Professor. The highest Quinn grade over Pete there. ever got in college, so <laughs> let's go to the commanders. The final B plus from Pete Prisco there. Uh, as Brady mentioned, look, everybody's gonna talk about what they did in the first round. Ryan, let's talk about what they did in the fifth. Taking quarterback Sam Howell. If I was <laughs> counting correctly, I think he was the sixth quarterback off the board. What do you think about the commander's draft and the B plus from Pete? Uh, I like the B+. Plus. Uh, I mean, Sam Howell went after Bailey Zappi in the draft, and I don't think anyone on planet Earth, including Bailey Zappi's folks, uh, thought he was going to go above Sam Howell. But here we are. So I think it's a, a good opportunity for Sam Howell to go to a program where he doesn't have to feel the pressure of playing right away because we say all the time that's the concern of these young quarterbacks. I think the person feeling the real pressure might be Carson Wentz because he has to come in there, prove that he's worthy. And I think Sam Howell did a lot of things really well under tough circumstances last season. Did he deserve to be a first-round pick? No. I thought he might go in round two. I was surprised he got to, uh, to day three. But here we are. He'll have an opportunity to play some football and perhaps get on the field this year, depending on how things go with Carson Wentz. If only I was a quarterback at Arizona State, then I would have gotten all A's like they gave Brady at Notre Dame. But that's a whole other story. <laughs> uh, I love this draft. I really do. I think Sam Howe is a steal when they got him. Uh, Dotson is going to be a really good impact wide receiver early in his career. I didn't love the pick of the running back in the third round, Brian Robinson, but they do. Uh, they want to get tougher running between the tackles. Percy Butler is a guy who can really run. Uh, and Cole Turner is an interesting tight end. I thought they had a better draft than most people expected uh, and they did some really good maneuvering to get some picks back by trading down uh, and still adding Dotson in the first round. All right, guys, hang on just a second. We're going to go through all of the teams and get the grades from Pete Prisco when it comes to the draft. But taking a look at the top 10 teams getting the highest grades from Pete Prisco, the only A plus going to the Ravens, nothing lower than a B plus going to the Commanders. There, uh, all teams in the NFC East getting a good grade from Professor Prisco. Coming up, Kenny Pickett was the first quarterback off the board, and then we waited, and we waited until Desmond Ritter went in the third. So what grade does Pete give those teams now? The Steelers and the Falcons find out next. So first it was Kenny Pickett, and then it was only Kenny Pickett. The Steelers drafting the former Pitt quarterback 20th overall. Then we all sat and waited and waited through the rest of the first round, all the way through the second round, until the Falcons took Desmond Ritter 74th overall. The last time we saw only one quarterback go in the first round was all the way back in 2013. Last year, there were five that went in the first round four the year before that. Let's welcome back in Pete Prisco, Brady Quinn, and Ryan Wilson here going through Pete's grades for each team in the draft. So let's start with the Steelers uh, taking Kenny Pickett. Pete, you're giving them a B. Tell us why. Well, I like the pick of Pickett. Um, I really did. I mean, uh, I had Malik Willis go in there in my mock draft, and I had a line in there, they don't draft small quarterbacks, and yet I didn't talk myself out of it. I mean, I, I think Kenny Pickett, I mean, he was the perfect guy for them, Pickett was. He was that guy you could put in there. He'll compete for the job right away. Uh, I love the fact that he knows which way to go in the building because all he had to do was go one way or the other way. Now he's going to the left where he used to go to the right where the pit facility was. So it's a great pick. I didn't love the pick of Pickens, but by the way, uh, the big receiver out of Georgia. I like the pick of Calvin Austin uh, later in the draft, the little wide receiver from Memphis. We know what the Steelers could do with fast, shifty wide receivers, and that's what Austin is. 
So to recap, uh, Pete doesn't like small quarterbacks. He loves small wide receivers. Doesn't like big wide receivers for big quarterbacks. Got it. Uh, <laughs> I love the George Pickens. Speed, pick baby, because, speed. Uh, <laughs> Pickens is fast. What are you talking about? I love both these players. But I think Pickens, the thing with Pickens, and we talked about this, Pete, is that, yeah, he does. The issue is the the maturity stuff. And I I get it. And if you're going to go to a place, Pittsburgh is a place to go to if you might have some sort of off-field maturity issues. Uh, Calvin Austin, I am with you, Pete. Even though he is small, I do love him. And the concerns with small receivers are durability. He was incredibly durable at Memphis, played mostly outside, which is sort of interesting, uh, but he'll be used in all sorts of roles uh, as they move on from Juju Smith-Schuster and James Washington and Ray Ray McLeod. I love their draft. I would give it a much higher grade than this. I'd say more Ooh. like an A-, minus, um, in part because of Kenny Pickett. I think it's a great fit for all the, all the reasons mentioned, but I do like George Pickens. He gives you that different body type as far as attacking downfield with some of that speed, and he can say he doesn't play fast, but I don't know. He's playing a bunch, a bunch of SEC guys that he's going to be seeing playing against in the NFL. So we'll find out then. And the Pittsburgh Steelers have a great track record of drafting wide receivers. But DeMarvin Leal is the one that I really like out of Texas A&M. Now, he didn't play as well this past season in 2021. Had a much better 2020 season. That being said, he's a perfect fit for their system. In your you know, prototypical 3-4 defense, he can play that five technique. He's the perfect frame for that. And look, if you look at how much times, or how many times they're going to have to play a four down front, he could slide down inside at two or six four, 290 pounds and play that three technique. I mean, Stefan Tuitt has to do it from time to time. And oh, by the way, Stefan Tuitt is on the final year of his deal. So there's a good chance that, much like we've seen in the past with Alexander Highsmith, for example, and, and getting drafted there, knowing that Bud Dupree eventually was going to move on, this feels like that sort of move where DeMarvin Leal may be drafted to eventually replace Stefan Tuitt if they don't foresee them taking him on. But even Connor Haywood, you know, Cameron Haywood's brother, he's like a Swiss Army knife. He can do a bunch of different things, you know, for that offense. So I, I really did like their draft. I thought they drafted to exactly what they needed to fit their team, what they do well. So you'd move the Steelers up to an A-. minus. We didn't have one, by the way. Uh, Pete didn't hand out an A-. minus. What do you think about the Raiders, though? Look, they didn't have a pick to the third round because Devontae Adams is probably well worth it, though. What, do you, what grade would you give them? Pete gives them a B. That's about fair. I mean, you know, they didn't have that many picks, and I think it's, it's hard to really do much when your, your biggest acquisition, you could say, was Devonta Adams, right? Like, that was what this draft was all about, being able to get a game-changing number one wide receiver. The guy I would probably highlight the most is Zamir White. I think he gives them a different option out of the backfield. His running style is really built for the NFL. Uh, he's not the most elusive guy, but he's a north-south one cut, and he will make someone miss. He's got enough burst and speed to be able to hit a home run. He's a bigger back, too. And the good thing about Georgia running backs are that he's usually running back by committee, so he doesn't have quite as much wear and tear on him. Uh, and that's a pick that's going to come in handy, too, right? Josh Jacobs, their former first-round pick, well, the Raiders didn't pick up the fifth-year option. So uh, once Jacobs moves on, as Pete Prisco loves to say, you draft another one and recycle him. And, and it goes on and on and on. So Zamir White will be that next running back. That gets thrown into the mix to eventually be recycled. Look, how, look at Pete smiling. Look how happy he is about this. Because he's right. He's, he's, he's right in this. <laughs> they're, all catching up, they're all catching up to me in this league now, finally. <laughs> see, see, Brady, Amanda, this is what I had to deal with for three straight days. Pete peacocking around the set because he hit a bunch of home runs. I'll, I'll give him credit. He did a good job last weekend. As for the Raiders, it, it's not a super sexy draft, as, as uh, Brady sort of talked about. But Brady also alluded to the fact that that draft class is now up on their rookie deal. Three of those first rounders aren't getting their fifth-year option. There will be no problem with this draft class, no first rounders, but I think this play, this class, while not incredibly sexy, will do go a long way in helping that Josh McDaniels uh, offense and, and the other side of the ball as well in year one. I think they're all set with Devontae Adams and Derek Carr. It's just a matter of filling in some holes, and I felt like they did that in this draft. Ryan, what do you think about the Bills? Pete gave them a B. Uh, they got Kyer Elam there. That was a need for them. We saw recently, I think today, his combine interview with the Bills coming out. And, I mean, the dude came prepared. What do you think about the grade of a B, Ryan, for the Bills? No, that, I think that's fair. And there were some questions about the – why James Cook went instead of another running back that didn't seem to have the same skill set as Devin Singletary. But you mentioned Kyrie Elam, and he, he's a fantastic player. They traded back up in the first round to get him. Clearly that's who they wanted, and he, he's going to pair with Trey White once he's healthy from the ACL. They had very few needs in terms of, of, of glaring holes, and I think Kyrie Elam was that guy that they wanted. Because of the physicality, uh, he does everything so incredibly well. 
And the only issue I had with him, not that he's tall or fast or strong, is that he wasn't as good a tackler in the run game as I would have liked. But that's something you can work on. And, and of course, at, at pick 180, there's Pete's favorite player in the draft, punter Matariza. I'm glad that the Bills got him as well. Hey, I love Matariza. Let's talk about the Bengals here. Pete giving them a B. Uh, what I love the most about this, though, Brady, your favorite pick of theirs is Pete's worst pick of theirs. Yeah, and, and I think it's just a difference of opinion <laughs> with all this. Look, you knew the first round they were going to get some secondary help. They went, went with Daxton Hill. I'm sure he was the best player available. Made sense. Jesse Bates is going to play under the franchise tag for this year, so eventually he's going to move on. They probably won't look to pay him. But uh, Cam T uh, Taylor Britt uh, is a taller body, long, you know, longer levered cornerback who's got some burst and speed and some recovery to him. And I think he's a guy that is going to immediately help on special teams and potentially replace Eli Apple at that cornerback spot. So Pete may not be high on him. Had a chance to watch him a number of times this year. I think he's the type of guy that will be end up being a better pro than he was, uh, you know, a college player for Nebraska. Pete, you're giving them a B. You're also giving the Tampa Bay Buccaneers a B as well. No first round pick for the Bucs. Uh, however, they had the first pick of the second round. They took Logan Hall out of Houston. Tell us about this great Pete. Yeah, and when you look at this team, they have one really major hole heading into, into the draft, and that was defensive tackle, you know, next to Vita Vea. They needed somebody there, uh, and they grabbed Logan Hall, who's a really good player. So I like what they did there, and I really like the pick of Luke Gedeke in the second round. He's one of my favorite offensive linemen in this draft. He's a converted tight end. He's tough. He's nasty. I think he's going to compete at left guard right away. Ultimately, he'll probably be the right tackle if they move worse over to the left tackle when Donovan Smith is done. So I like what they did. Uh, Kate Otten's an interesting tight end as well. I don't love the pick of the running back, uh, Rashad White from Arizona State. I, I just think sometimes you look, you can, I don't think he's the kind of running back they needed to get. I know he looks a lot like Leonard Fournette, but I didn't like that pick at all. You know, the only reason he's doing this is because anytime I support my, my Notre Dame brethren, my, you know, my, my fellow, fellow players there coming out of Notre Dame, he's not going to say, well, I didn't, I didn't compliment Rashad White. You know, he's an Arizona State, you know, Sun Devil. But that's what Pete's doing right here. He actually likes the pick. He just doesn't want to admit it for our little back and forth. Pete, is that what it is? No, no, that's not what it is because, believe me, Arizona State doesn't have very many players who got drafted. So when they do get one, I'd like to compliment him. And he's not a bad player. I just don't think this was a good pick for the Bucs. All right, we're moving through these teams. Let's go to the Saints. The last B from Mr. Professor Pete Prisco there. Mr. Honey Badger now headed to the Saints. Uh, but they did trade up. They grabbed Chris Olave. What do you think about this grade for the Saints? Well, I love the player. And, and I think I maybe know a little bit what's behind the grade. I mean, they only had, what, five draft picks or selections this year. But it was a need. I mean, bottom line is we don't know what to take from Michael Thomas. I think those two pair together, Chris Olave and Michael Thomas, two Buckeyes, uh, could be explosive for Jameis Winston. Uh, but not knowing what to expect, you know, you went ahead and you drafted a need, a tackle with Trevor Penning, great spot. Olave's the one that's going to make the biggest difference, in my opinion, as far as whether or not this offense goes. They need someone on the outside to help take the pressure off Alvin Kamara in the backfield, uh, and he's going to be that guy. He's a refined route runner. He's got some of the best hands you're going to find. Uh, now, he's not the biggest guy, but he's a burner, and that's what you need in today's game, the ability to separate. So I, I love the pick. I do think what they gave to go up and get him is a bit pricey for someone outside of being a quarterback. Yeah, that's my question, Brady. They, they moved up twice, once a few weeks ago with the Eagles, and once again on draft night to get Chris Olave, who you mentioned is not the most physical wide receiver and going into the NFL. Perhaps he can be, and that's fine, but the route running's there, the hands are there, all the things you mentioned. And then they got Trevor Penning. They needed offensive line help after Teron Armstead signed in Miami. We had uh, Rick Spielman on the set with us the whole weekend of the draft, and he said he would feel comfortable playing Trevor Penning at left tackle. I don't know if I would, only because he's an FCS guy, hasn't played against a lot of high-level competition. He was okay in the Iowa State game early last season for, for you and I. He did okay at the Senior Bowl. He was incredibly aggressive, but now he's going to be going up against NFL edge rushers week in and week out. We'll see how that works out, but, but I understand why the Saints did what they did, but, but I'm with you. I thought maybe it might have been a little too pricey. That was our last B. Let's go to the Broncos who get a B- minus from Pete Briscoe for their draft. Look, no first-round pick uh, because of Russell Wilson, so that's right. fine. Yeah, they're good. They're yeah, good you're that. good. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're fine. You get an A, uh, but what do you think about their draft? It was an interesting draft. You know, I think when you start off with a player like Nick Benito, who's really undersized for an edge rusher, but uh, special talent, special skill. I, I think you brought in Randy Gregory. You already have Bradley Chubb. Uh, it's going to make passing downs a living hell for whatever team has to go up against them. That's what Benito brings. Uh, the guy I wanted to point out the most, though, is Greg Dulcich, only because he's a unique player at the tight end spot. Uh, didn't run overly well, but he actually plays faster than probably what his 40 time was. 
great hands, former wide receiver, good route runner uh, to go along with that. And, you know, traditionally hasn't been a position that the, uh, I should say Russell Wilson back in just Seattle, utilized heavily. Uh, but you go add this passing option and they're amongst all the other weapons that they have there in Denver, it's a dangerous combination. So he's not the type of guy you're going to put in line, have him block a ton. He's a willing blocker, I'll give him that. So you can throw him somewhere on the line of scrimmage, have him cut off the backside. But he is another weapon for Russell Wilson and one that's versatile. Split him out, put him wherever you want. He's going to catch the football for you. Uh, Ryan, let me ask you this. The Falcons also getting a B-plus from Pete Briscoe there. We did end up seeing Desmond Ritter finally go to them in the third round. What do you think about a B-minus for the Falcons, Ryan? No, I think that's right. And I think this is a great fit for Des Ritter for much of the same reasons we were talking about Sam Howell going to Washington. No pressure to play right away. He is basically a Marcus Mariota clone, uh, very similar in their styles. Uh, I think Marcus Mariota is a little more fluid thrower, but that's something that Des Ritter can work on. And he doesn't have to play right away. But the pick that I liked the most uh, out of all the picks they had, and they did, some, they did some really good things, I thought, over the weekend, was Tyler Algier, the running back out of BYU. He reminds me a lot of uh, James Conner. He ran about a 4.65, I think. Plays so much faster than that. Uh, he's incredibly strong. He can run between the tackles. He can bounce it outside. You're not going to arm tackle him. He's an asset in the pass game as well. And again, this is 465 getting the corner and making it look pretty easy. I think he adds some depth to a group that includes Cordero Patterson, Damian Williams, and Quadri Allison. There's a chance he plays a lot and helps that offense, which really needed some playmakers in this draft class. You know, Pete mentioned this uh, on Thursday night where we were talking about the, the, the Atlanta Falcons and the selection to go with Drake London. Uh, probably one of their higher graded players, but it's not about this upcoming season. It's really about two years from now. Obviously, they don't have Calvin Ridley for this year. But when you got London next to Kyle Pitts and eventually Calvin Ridley there, that's going to be three nice weapons to throw to, whether it's Desmond Ritter or Marcus Mariota, whoever else it would be. So uh, I can see the reasoning or rationale behind that particular pick. Uh, Arnold Ebicady, the edge rusher out of Penn State, he was a guy that I thought was really underrated. It's obviously a need for the Atlanta Falcons, and he's a guy who I think is, is going to end up stepping up and having an impact on this roster right away. As far as Ritter, I think it's a good spot for him, you know, giving Arthur Smith, Smith's experience, or, you know, really turning around Ryan Tannehill's career in Tennessee. The only question I have, though, is, is there's some fundamental things I think he still needs to work on to continue to clean up some of that, uh, the accuracy issues. Outside of that, he checks off all the boxes. And so he may find his way into the starting role sooner rather than later, and either because he just flat out beats out Marcus Mariota and looks better, or because Marcus Mariota has never played 16 or 17 games, for that matter, fully healthy. So eventually, Desmond Ritter is going to have to go in and play this year. We know that. Pete, talk to us about the Jaguars. Once again, they had the first overall pick. No surprise. It was a terrible surprise. They took Trayvon Walker. They did trade up to get Devin Lloyd. A lot of people like them taking Chad Muma as well. Pete, why a B- minus for the Jags? Well, I wouldn't have taken Walker, first off. I would have taken Evan Neal. I think he'll be the best player in this draft class. And I think this had to be a year about building, uh, you know, a, a whole offense around Trevor Lawrence. Now, they've done some good things. They could have continued to do that. Uh, Walker's going to be a good football player. I don't think he's ever going to be a dynamic pass rusher. He's a tough physical player. I like the pick. I like the player, but I would have gone in a different direction on the offensive line. Devin Lloyd, I do like. I think that was aggressive to go up and get him. Now, when you look at what Mike Caldwell is going to do, he's going to have two run and chase linebackers. You remember they played, paid Ola Kuhn a lot of money to, from Atlanta to be the other linebacker. Uh, it'll be a lot like Tampa Bay with Devin White and Levante David. I can't figure out why they picked Chad Muma. I can't. He's a good football player. He's an interesting football player, but where's he playing? You don't play three linebackers. Unless they're going to put in special packages uh, when Lloyd puts his hand down on the ground, which he's been apt to do. Uh, I don't know when how much Chad Muma's going to play. I didn't like that pick. And I think they could have used the tight end as well at some point in this draft. So that kind of dropped the grade down a little bit. All right. Let's yep. No, I'm with you, Pete. I think that's exactly right. Oh, sorry, Amanda. Nope. Go for it. Go for it. I was waiting to hear from you. Oh, good. Because Noah didn't get in my ear, even though it says in the rundown I'm supposed to go. So, Noah, let me know. Uh, yeah, so I like Luke Fortner, the center. I thought he was an important part of the center part of that defense. And to Pete's point about Chad Muma, I I'm with you. Chad Muma's a fantastic player. He tested off the charts, played really well at Wyoming. But where do you play him? And maybe their, their plan is to get a, a wall of linebackers 10 yards behind, behind the line of scrimmage and do something there. But otherwise, it's not clear what their plan is. Devin Lloyd's a home run. But uh, uh, I think Pete's right about drafting offensive linemen before, before Tron Walker. We get another B minus for the reigning Super Bowl champs, the Rams here. Look, they didn't have a pick to the third round. Um, I think Sean McVay was having a very good time. It looked like what it. What do you think about the Rams? 
after the third round. Well, after the, the first round, round, we knew they were going to go after an offensive lineman because they were just shocked. They were flabbergasted by the fact that the Patriots took Cole Strange in the first round. Uh, so they get, well, they get Logan Bruss there out of Wisconsin. I like this pick. I think he's a guy who can work his way into being an immediate starter for them. We know those Wisconsin offensive linemen are well-schooled and prepared coming up the NFL level with the variety of schemes they're taught up there in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, but you can go through the rest of the draft. I mean, uh, Quentin Lake, uh, uh, Darian Kendrick, both these guys are going to impact this, this secondary right away. They might not be day one starters, but they'll find their way after a year or two or, or through injuries, and they're both very capable of being just that. Now, the guy I'm going to highlight, though, is you know who I'm going with. It, it's, it's Kyron Williams. Versatile back. Shocking. I think he that takes off a lot of pressure on Cam Akers, and he's a three-down back. A anything you ask him to do, pass protection, catching the football out of the backfield, splitting out wide like a wide receiver and catching a touchdown pass like we're watching. He can do it all, and he's the type of guy that I think is a perfect fit for the locker room and the type of character you're trying to build. So I know Pete's going to probably give me a hard time about it, but that's how much I love this kid. That's how much that team, the coaching staff, loves this kid, and I promise you the LA Rams will not regret making that selection. If I took a gold can of spray paint and sprayed that Arizona State helmet gold, you'd pick me. I really believe that. I'd be, I'd be a third-round pick in your book. Did I tell you that he didn't love Kyle Hamilton either, but he still gave the Ravens an A. Oh, I know. I know. Yeah, didn't we're just, we don't him, even man. have time to go into that. Uh, let's talk about the Titans. Pete, this is where we finally saw Malik Willis go in the third round. They did say goodbye to A.J. Brown in the middle of the draft. You gave them a B-minus as well. Tell us about this grade. Well, I like what they did with A.J. Brown. Look, I like A.J. Brown, but I see it from an economic standpoint as well. Uh, A.J. Brown, better receiver than Traylon Burks. We know that, but he's not. How, is he 10 times a better receiver in terms of the money? Probably not. And so they replaced a, a big physical receiver who runs better than Burks with Burks, who's another big physical receiver. So I like that. I really like Roger McCreary in the second round. You know, a lot of people pinged him for his short arms. You put on the tape, he's feisty, competitive in the SEC, does a great job. And you mentioned Willis in the third round. I think that's perfect for him. I think this is a perfect situation for Malik Willis. I think he can go in there, spend the year learning behind Ryan Tannehill. And if Tannehill busts out again like he's done at key moments over the last couple seasons, then you can replace him and put Malik Willis in. So I think the Titans were solid. Uh, I think that there were some opportunities where they could have been better. But this is a solid draft. Pete, I will say so far, Brady and Ryan are agreeing with most of your grades. So apparently you are right all the time. Pete had a great draft. He really did. I would say that of, of all the people we've talked, and, and Ryan obviously has done a thousand mock drafts, a lot of credit to his hard work. Pete called it, though, early and often, and he got it right. This was We've worked together for I don't know how many years now, eight years, and this was by far and away Pete's best draft. He's like a fine wine. He just keeps getting better with age. I, am I really hearing this? Is this coming through? I, got, I can't believe he just said that. Where's the shot now? Take the shot. We make sure we, we no have shot. this on camera. We'll get I, I said, some confetti. I, if anything, it'd be a fine yeah, bottle yeah. of wine there called you Pete Prisco. There you go. All right, you guys <laughs> hang on just a second here. Uh, look, all these guys at some point or another are on the Pick 6 podcast. That is your home for all things NFL. Make sure to look for the latest episode talking about DeAndre Hopkins being suspended for the first six games of the season. So coming up, we're all wondering what the Seahawks were going to do in the draft. Would they take a quarterback? So many needs for this team. I will tell you, every team from here on out getting a C or lower, according to Professor Prisco. Seahawks fans excited? Huh? Now well, you got uh, Charles Cross coming in. Left tackle. That was your top ten pick. Uh, Pete Prisco did not think the Seahawks did that well. A C even though they did have a top 10 pick. A lot of these teams that Pete gives a C or a D to are teams that didn't have first round picks, but Seattle had a first round pick, had a top 10 pick, and we'll find out why Pete didn't particularly like what the Seahawks did in just a second. As we recap the top 10 in the NFL draft last Thursday night. Chris Hassel joined by Brady Quinn in studio. We also have Pete Prisco and Ryan Wilson with us. Pete, why is it a C for Seattle? Well, look, Charles Cross is a good football player, and I think he fills a major need for him. I didn't mind that pick. He's not a, a great run blocker, and what do, what do the Seahawks want to do? They want to run the football. So there's a little concern there. But, again, I go back to the philosophy. Where are they? Are they stuck 
in the early 2000s, mid late 2000s, when they want to run the ball, play great defense? Or are they are they going to start opening things up? Because they drafted a running back, Ken Walker. I I don't get it. They have running backs. I mean, it just made no sense from top to bottom. I think this is a team searching for an offensive identity. They don't know what it is. Pete Carroll still wants to run the ball and play great defense. We know that doesn't work anymore. Uh, and yet they drafted with that with an eye on that. I don't understand their draft. Pete did like the pick of Cincinnati cornerback Kobe Bryant in the fourth round, though. Moving on to the 49ers, also a C here for San Francisco. And, Ryan, they did not have a pick in the top 50. Their first pick was 61, defensive end Drake Jackson. Right, they started the Jake, uh, Drake Jackson, excuse me, and Mr. Irrelevant Brock Purdy at the end there from Iowa State. In between, the, the, my favorite pick was uh, Clea Davis at UCF. Now, the issue with Clea Davis is that he tore his ACL on November 21st, only played five games the last two years, but he is explosive. He's a spark plug in the middle of that defense. He's incredibly twitchy for someone who's 6'1", 302, and if he can stay healthy, he's going to be an impact player. They got late in the draft there. Uh, the pick before they got Nick Zakel out of Fordham, an offensive lineman who admittedly struggled at the Senior Bowl, but he had a really good season uh, at Fordham. And then Danny Gray is probably the most explosive pick they got. I don't think he was taken to replace any possible Debo Samuel departure, but uh, he is a speedster. I think he ran in the sub-4-4s, four only 5'11", about 190, but he was one of the best in terms of contested catches last year down the field for SMU. All right, continuing on with teams that Pete Prisco gave a C to in the NFL draft. And the next team, the L.A. Chargers. They get a C, Brady. They had a top. Uh, 20 pick and it was Zion Johnson at number 17. I mean goal number one is protect Justin Herbert at all costs so it makes some sense there he's going to immediately impact the interior of that offensive line uh, probably probably one of the best interior offensive linemen in this draft class so you get some nastiness you get some physicality up front that helps out protect your franchise quarterback and then really you look out through the rest of the draft you get some running back help with Isaiah Spiller I actually liked him as arguably the best running back in this draft class kind of the do it all bell cow type of back you can rely on and probably my favorite pick Jamari Sawyer. I just think when you go back and watch some of the tape, the size that, you know, he's not the most um, uh, athletic guy because he's so massive, but he can get the job done. So I think when you look at these first five picks, all of these guys are going to play a factor into the Chargers this season right away. Yeah, Brady, I really like Zion Johnson. I mean, when you, he's played guard, he's played left tackle, he could play center, and he, you know, he took a bunch of snaps at center at the Senior Bowl, impressed a lot of guys, and he's one of those players that you plug and you play him wherever you want to play him, and, and I really believe that. I think he can play all three positions, and also I think there's a chance they might take a look at him at right tackle. If you look at the right tackle spot, it was bad last year. Uh, I know they drafted Salyer, a player I liked a lot out of Georgia. He could also compete at right tackle, but they have to get better on that offensive line. Smart draft Thing by getting those two guys. And Pete, when you give a team a C, is that are you looking at that as average or is that a little below average for you? It's probably a little bit below average, average to below average. I mean, I, you know, look, it's hard to give Fs out. I mean, I've given out Fs back in the day, um, but it's think. hard to give out Fs these days uh, because I think there's, there's a lot more teams that do. I think they're doing better in the later rounds than they used to do, to be honest with you. Okay, yeah, no Fs given out, uh, I don't believe in this uh, graft grade class for Pete Prisco. Let's move on to another C, and it's the Miami Dolphins, Pete. They did not have a, a pick in the first or second round. No, but they have an A for a trade by getting Tyreek Hill. He's going to change the, dy the dynamic of their offense with his speed if Tua can play. And that's the big if with this team. But I, I love the pick of Channing Tindall. He's one of my favorite players in this entire draft, the linebacker out of Georgia. You know, all, all process, draft process, I kept telling Ryan, the two Georgia linebackers that I like the most are Quay Walker and Channing Tindall. And I stuck by that. And I think that played out with the way they were drafted. I think they're going to be better NFL players than N'Kobe Dean. One more thing. They took Skylar Thompson from Kansas State. When Tua busts out and Teddy Bridgewater takes over, then, no, nah, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I mean, look, it's hard. He's in a tough place giving a grade. you got four picks to work with, and none of which on the first couple of rounds. So mm -hmm. to his point, Tyreek Hill was your, what this draft was all about. You went and got him. Now he's a part of your roster with that explosiveness. Uh, Eric Ezukama from Texas Tech is another wide receiver I'd be really excited about, but as a fourth-round pick, I'm not even so sure he's going to make the roster initially. This roster is so loaded with speed and ability. 
uh, but at six foot three, over 200 pounds, you see some of the yards after the catch ability, downfield ability, making big plays for them. It's just a crowded wide receiver room. And Cameron Good, he's going to immediately impact their special teams at six foot four, 240 pounds. Uh, he's got the sort of frame you're looking for in that regard. You know, maybe finds his way on the field on defense, uh, playing alongside of Channing Tindall. But uh, the reality is the last pick uh, with Skylar Thompson, I don't know that he's ever going to be an answer for them outside of maybe doing some things throughout the course of the year in practice and, and being there for him. Because if Tua doesn't work out, they're looking back in the draft next year. And next year, uh, Ryan Wilson has a brand new mock-up for, for next year, his first 2023 mock. And there's three quarterbacks in the top ten. You can check that out, CBSSports.com. The Browns hope to have the quarterback situation figured out now with Deshaun Watson. They get a C for the draft from Pete. Brady, what would you think of what your Browns did? Yeah, I mean, look, they weren't going to set the world on fire because of the position that they were in drafting in the third round. You know, again, you're, this draft was about you got Deshaun Watson and eventually got to move on from Baker Mayfield and figure that situation out. But a couple players I really like just from watching the tape. David Bell right away jumps off the page. I mean, anytime Purdue needed a big play this past year, they really didn't have much help out around him. He was the guy they targeted and went to. Now, he hasn't demonstrated the, the most speed, so I'll be curious to see uh, if, he can, if he can separate or if he can consistently make contested catches. But you go on down the line, you look at a guy like Isaiah Thomas who played a big impact in Oklahoma's defense this year. Perion Winfrey as well, too, playing from the interior. These are some good, good football players. A lot of upside, too, on Alex Wright with his size and length coming off the edge out of uh, Alabama, Birmingham. I mean, down the line, I thought the Cleveland Browns did the most of the picks that they were given to find guys who can make this roster. Because again, it's not really a depleted roster. You're really thinking about special teams and depth with this group and development and players that can maybe eventually be a starter when one of those big money guys you just can't afford to pay anymore. Yeah, and Cade York ended up going in the fourth round. I heard that he might go late three or maybe be one of the first specialists off the board. He ended up being the first specialist off the board. And some people didn't like the pick, but here's the thing. The Browns need a kicker, number one. And number two, if you hit an Evan McPherson tight home run with this pick, awesome. Uh, but the guy that I really like was the pick that came afterwards at 156, Jerome Ford, the running back out of Cincinnati. The Alabama transfer ran in the four fours. He's, uh, uh, he can run between the tackles. He can bounce it outside. He is incredibly tough. He's a willing and really good blocker. He caught 21 passes last season, so he can help you in that aspect as well. And it just makes you wonder if any of the, the, the buzz about Kareem Hunt's future in, in Cleveland might be such that you need some, some depth behind uh, Nick Chubb, and, and that depth might include Jerome Ford being taken in the fifth round. All right, so the Browns, another team with a C from Pete Prisco. One more C handed out by Pete. It's to the Minnesota Vikings, who traded down in the first round, picked at 32, and got... Georgia safety, Lewis Seen. What was the, 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 the pick that you liked the most, Brady? The well, Vikings? I'll get to that. I do want to ask Pete, though, why the C? What did you not like about Minnesota? He's giving everybody C's, it seems. Well, like. at, at this point in the draft, when you came in, we, with the A and B block, we gave them A's and then B's. Now, how did I get the stuck blocks. with all these, these middling teams? Here? Well, I don't know. But, Pete, what was the justification for the C here? What did you not like about Minnesota's draft class? You know, they moved up and down the board, and I don't think they – I think at times they gave away too much to do it. I, I think they could have stood pat and still ended up with a lot of the guys they ended up with. I, I thought they got a little aggressive at times, Brady. That's why I kind of dropped them down a little bit. Look, I like Lewis Seen. I think he's a good player. I really do. But uh, I just think the way they maneuvered the board – They remember, they were sitting high in the first round at one point. Uh, did it really work out that well for them? I don't know. Well, I would say this. Clearly, the focus of this draft class was defense. Five of the first six picks were on the defensive side of the ball, whether it's Seen or anyone else. Brian Osimo, though, i got to give a little love because that was Pete's number one player on his better-than list. Mm. And I do think he's that hybrid linebacker type that you're seeing more often in the NFL, able to cover, able to drop into coverage, still big enough and physical enough to play the run. And when you look at the linebacker situation there, they just signed Jordan Hicks. Really, if you look at the deal, it says two years, it's really a one-year deal. So there could be a spot for Brian Osamo to slide into that starting spot. Andrew Booth, some people mocked up as a first-round cornerback, so I think there's some value there too. And again, needs for this team. So I don't care if you're talking about Jalen Naylor or even some of the other players, Ty Chandler down the list. They got some good quality football players that are going to be able to help them out or at least provide depth for them. Okay, let's take a look at the teams that Pete gave C grades to. And he said for him, a C is just a little bit below average, though uh, he would certainly take one at Arizona State. Uh, Seahawks, 49ers, Chargers, Dolphins, Browns, and Vikings. We have a handful of teams left. Does anybody get an F? Does he even go with a D? I mean, come on, Pete. Let's be critical a little bit. Patriots one of those teams. So are the Cardinals. We'll find out next.
All right, we've got five teams left to grade in the NFL draft in 22. Chris Hassel, Brady Quinn, Pete Prisco, and Ryan Wilson. Pete's the one handing out the grades. When you take a look, Pete, at what the New England Patriots did, when you take a look at their total package, what grade would you give them? I didn't like their draft at all. I gave them a C-. I really didn't. And, look, everybody sits there and says, well, how dare we question Bill Belichick? Go back and look at some of his draft picks. I mean, seriously, he's had some bad draft picks, um, and they got lucky with Tom Brady. So that's it in a nutshell for him drafting football players. He's a great coach. I don't necessarily think he's a great personnel guy. Uh, I didn't really love the pick of Strange in the first round, the, the offensive lineman. Um, I did really like the second-round pick. Tyquan Thornton, the wide receiver out of Baylor. He will add a nice speed element to the offense. And in a shot just for Ryan, I wonder if Mac Jones will be able to reach him when he gets down the field. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I, I'll just start off by saying this. When you look at this draft class, we can say whatever we want about it, but the New England Patriots have forever always had a way of evaluating players and saying we're going to grab guys who we know will make our roster. Uh, they're not necessarily looking at guys that are probably top-rated because Tyquan Thornton is a guy that I would imagine on most people's draft boards was ranked higher than Cole Strange, whereas we already heard the L.A. Rams talk about the fact that they thought he'd be there in the third round. Mm -hmm. So uh, clearly there's an intent there. There's a need. They fulfilled that with the Strange pick. But I'm with Pete. I love Tyquan Thornton. I think his up, you know, top end ability and speed, and he's raw as a wide receiver, so he's just getting there. But you can look on throughout their draft class. Marcus Jones and Jack Jones will both be impact players at some point on that defense. Um, even Pierre Strong as far as a running back. You know, the, the Zappy pick is the one that's most interesting, only because you've got Brian Hoyer as the older veteran there who knows the system, and then Jarrett Stidham. So clearly the running's on the wall for one of the two. And I think maybe you're saying to yourself, if Mac Jones gets hurt, we need a guy who kind of mimics some of his play. You see that in Zappi. I mean, neither are really a running threat. They're both pretty solid passing from the pocket. Zappi can make all, you know, all the throws you need him to make. Doesn't have the strongest arm, but can shape throws, do all those sorts of things. He's a full field read quarterback. You see him work front side to back side. So, you know, did you take him maybe a little too early? I don't know, maybe not. You know, the Patriots seem to have a lot of intel sometimes on when these guys are going to go. Uh, but that was the only pick that I think for some people was probably a little bit of a head scratch only because you just took Mac Jones in the first round last year and you already got a loaded quarterback room. What would you think, Ryan? Yeah, I'm sort of surprised Pete didn't make the joke that Mac Jones could throw the ball to Bailey Zappi. It's a cutoff man and then throw to Tyquan Thornton down the field. Uh, <laughs> but you can use that one next time, Pete, free in charge. The Bailey Zappi pick is sort of curious. I think it does mean the writing's on the wall for one of those two backup quarterbacks that you mentioned, Brady. Marcus Jones is the guy that I absolutely loved. I loved him throughout the process. I thought he was a late second rounder. If he were 5'11", 6 feet tall, he's a top 15 pick. He is so incredibly explosive. He plays like he's 6 feet tall. Uh, he can play outside or in. He can return. He's an absolute electric uh, return man, and he caught 10 passes last year for 109 yards. So I would imagine the Patriots who have a way of getting the most out of their players, a la Julian Edelman, for example. They find a way to get Marcus Jones on the field as much as possible. All right, so it's a C- minus for the New England Patriots. Another C- minus to the Arizona Cardinals, who have had an interesting start to the week. We learned today that uh, DeAndre Hopkins is out for the first six games of the season uh, for violating the league's substance abuse, the performance-enhancing uh, abuse uh, uh, fraction infraction. Brady, uh, actually, I'm going to go to Ryan on this. I'm all thrown off by Hopkins. I, I was going to draft him early and often. Trey McBride, Ryan, is your favorite pick that the Arizona Cardinals had. I really liked his game out of Colorado State, the big tight end. Yeah, he had 90 receptions for uh, 1,100 yards last season, only one touchdown. But he led all the FBS tight ends and, and catches receptions and yards per game at 93. And he can block. He can play in line. You can play him in the slot as well. He was my tight end one. Again, this tight end class wasn't as good as obviously last year's class. We started with Kyle Pitts and, and then, and then Friar Muth in that class. But I think he has a chance to, to be a, an incredibly effective player. He'll obviously get some opportunities now that uh, DeAndre Hopkins is going to miss the first month and a half of the season. But he was the highlight for me in this draft class that, as Pete would probably tell you, wasn't exactly uh, super exciting. They, they fill some needs for sure, but I think McBride, along with Zach Ertz and, and Max, Max, Max Williams, excuse me, gives Kyler Murray some middle of the field targets, especially now that, that Hopkins will be missing for some time. And again, out for violating the league's performance-enhancing substance policy. DeAndre Hopkins out, suspended without pay for the first six games of the season. Moving on to the Carolina Panthers, who also get a C-minus from Pete Prisco. They did have a top 10 pick. They used that number six pick on Icky. 
And clearly it was a need. Um, I think the problem becomes, you know, who's going to start in quarterback? We're still asking that question. You know, is it going to be Matt Corral, who you went up and got in the third round after not having a third round pick before the draft started? Uh, or, or is it going to be someone else yet to be determined at this point? So we'll have to wait and see on that. But Iki Aquanu clearly is going to be the prize of this class. They needed help on the offensive line. They're going to get it, even though he still has some developing to do. The other thing I think was the biggest takeaway was they wanted speed and they got speed. Whether it was linebacker Brandon Smith out of Penn State, who will beat immediate impact player on special teams and eventually maybe find his way on the field on defense. Amari Barno is going to be one of those pass rush specialists. Really undersized, I think, when you look him at 6'5", 246 frame. He looks like he plays lighter than that, but blazing fast. Still needs to have a little more refinement with his pass rush skills uh, as he's kind of a one-trick pony with some of that speed. And then Kalen Barnes, he's going to come to the NFL at cornerback and be one of the fastest players. Uh, so clearly, they wanted more speed on defense. Uh, they get that in a variety of ways, but there's still the question of the quarterback position. We have graded 30 teams, we being Pete Prisco. Not a single D or F yet, and still no Ds or Fs. It's the Indianapolis Colts, Pete, with a C-. minus. They didn't have a first-round pick. Yeah, this was close to being a D, but I really like the second-round pick, Alec Pierce, the wide receiver out of uh, Cincinnati. I, when you watch the Colts last year, the one thing they lacked was speed. They had none. They didn't scare anybody down the field. Team sat on everything. He can run. He gives them a, a guy who can get down the field with his speed, help open things up. Michael Pittman's a good receiver. He just doesn't run that well. Uh, I didn't like the pick of the tight end, Jelani Watt Woods, uh, in the third round. He's a good player. Bernard Ryman, look, he better be ready to play because they have a major hole at left tackle. He's got to step in there. So I did not love their draft at all. I think they could have gone in a bunch of different directions. But the lone D goes to the Chicago Bears, the last team that Pete Prisco is grading here, and it's the Bears getting a D. They did not have a first-round pick. They did get Kyler Gordon, the cornerback out of Washington, who uh, Ryan had him in the, the, the top uh, first round of his mock quite a bit, Pete. What, why did you dislike what Chicago did so much? No, I like that pick. I really do. I think Kyler Gordon's a good player. I would have taken Kyler Gordon ahead of Trent McDuffie who went much earlier. So I'm okay with that. Here's my problem. The right side of their offensive line, Dakota Dozier, Larry Bur Borum, that's not a good right side of an offensive line. It's okay, but you need to get better. And they waited too long to take an offensive lineman. That's my real problem with this draft. They didn't get any weapons either uh, on the outside. When you look at it, Velas Jones is more Velas Jones is more of a return man at Tennessee than receiver. So you really help your young quarterback. These drafts, when you have a young quarterback, have to be about developing that young quarterback. I get it. They needed a corner. I'm fine with that. But did you really need the safety? You could have gone in a different direction there. I didn't love their draft at all. Uh, that's why they ended up with the D. And it's cakes. It's the icing on the cake. You picked the punter. <laughs> uh, Ryan Poles did say after the draft, Pete, that the reason that they went uh, with Kyler Gordon and then Jaquan Brist Brister was because that's how their draft board fell. And I know you'll sometimes criticize teams for, for you know, picking beyond their means, and Poles didn't do that. But to your point, the offense isn't any better, and I'm sure that the, the quarterback, Justin Fields, was wondering when they were going to get a wide receiver. When they finally took one in Bayless Jones, he's 25 years old, and while he was good at Tennessee, he wasn't lights out great. And uh, he only had to, that sort of caught on late at the Senior Bowl. So I think he'll be an effective player. Uh, I think he'll do some good things, but he's not a game-changing talent. I love the, the additions they made in those first two picks, but, but as Pete has pointed out, the team's not better offensively, and that was hard to watch at times last year under Matt Nagy. Well, look, clearly this is what you do when you're a general manager in the NFC North. You just do not draft uh, wide receivers that high in the draft. You do not help out your quarterback in that regard, right? Haven't we seen that with the Green Bay Packers for a couple of decades now? In all seriousness, I think if you stop the draft after their first three picks, I would have given this, this draft an A. Uh, they didn't have a first-round pick, but you get first-round value in a guy like Kyle Gordon. Uh, I, I know Kyler Gordon. You look at Jaquan Brisker. He was one of the better playmaking safeties in this year's draft class. Great vision on quarterbacks, dropping into coverage, uh, kind of a ball hawk type guy who is a good tackler in open field. So I love that pick for their defense. And then Valus Jones, I think his best football is still ahead of him. Couldn't catch on really at USC quite the same way he did with making big plays down the field at Tennessee. And he, but he's very raw. And I, I, again, I still think his, his best play is ahead of him, but he's not drafted to really be a number one guy. He's more of a compliment to that. So Clearly, there's, there's some concern about Pete has about their offensive line, playmaking, building, all of that. 
Uh, but, you know, you draft what you draft. And Ryan Poles, you know, this is his first time doing it. Uh, he'll get more cracks at it. But it's, it's one of the reasons why Chicago Bears have largely struggled, as no one knows better than Chris Hassel, our host here. Ah, yes, lifelong Bears fan. And uh, I, hey, Chris. I, 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 yeah, go ahead. Hey, Chris, what? real Chris, real what? quick, uh, after this draft, Justin Fields probably uh, will scrap, scrub his uh, social media posts from all Chicago Bears well, references. Hey, Pete, don't go I mean, anywhere. Isn't that the trend nowadays? Yeah, Pete, don't go anywhere because I think Randy just called us. You're going to have to do a breaking hit after this in preparation for that. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't leave the camera. Pete, what's up, man? I mean, Ryan Wilson's already got his first mock out for next year. When's yours coming? Can I pick it apart? Can I pick his mock apart? No. Yeah, I'm why don't you come on I, Wednesday? We'll I, do I the four to five it. hour on Wednesday. <laughs> Where you just break down no, Ryan's that's mock. fantasy football. It's fantasy football okay. Wednesday. Well, uh, tomorrow it's Pete Frisco's power ranking. That's right. So uh, we'll get you then. Fellas, thank you. Let's look at the worst grades handed out by Pete Prisco for uh, the draft. The Bears getting the only D, and it's a solid D. He said Colts were close to a D, but it's a C- minus for the Colts, Panthers, Cardinals, and Patriots. The best grade given to the Baltimore Ravens, an A+. Pick 6 podcast with Will Brinson. Oh, Will Brinson's going to be busy on HQ these next few weeks with Pete Prisco taking some time off. Will Brinson joined by his uh, cast of characters, including uh, Ryan Wilson, John Breach, and others. Pick 6 podcast. Download and follow wherever you get your audio. Do you want a sports network that delivers everything that matters about the game? The highlights, the picks, the instant analysis. No yelling, no fake debates, no politics. Hit the subscribe button and never miss a moment.